Our jury system has been described as the sacred right of every American. Over the centuries, it's been called the Citadel of Freedom, the Lamp of Liberty, and the Voice of the People. Modestly, I, myself, have written a few things on the subject. I'm Thomas Jefferson. You might remember me for something I wrote over 200 years ago. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. This simple short document accused the English king of, among many other things, depriving us in many cases of trial by jury. You see, even back then we had the right to have our case decided by a jury of our peers. But when the king's courts were in England and the accused spent a long time on a slow prison ship, saying that we had jury trials was a poor joke. Bloody tyrants. <clears throat> so, you may ask, what's the big deal? Why have so many people heaped so much praise on the right to trial by jury? I like the answer a couple of writers gave back in the 60s. Your 60s, not my 60s. The jury is a remarkable political institution. It recruits 12 laymen, chosen at random from the widest population. It convenes them for the purpose of the particular trial. It entrusts them with great official powers of decision. It permits them to carry on deliberations in secret and to report out their final judgment without giving reasons for it. And after their momentary service to the state has been completed, it orders them to disband and return to private life. How splendid is that? Let's start at the beginning and see what all the fuss has been about. We have been cooling our heels here at Runnymede these three days. Well, if this meeting is a trick, and the king is plotting an ambush. If that be the case, he will find us ready to answer in kind. <laughs> Sire, you've had ample time to review the charter? I have. And you will keep your word and affix the royal seal? And if I do not? Tomorrow, England will be without a king. Signing will no doubt kill me as well as your blade, sir. But I'll do it. On June 15th, almost 800 years ago, a band of English barons gathered on the banks of the Thames to confront King John. The same King John, by the way, who had all that trouble with Robin Hood. They were sick of being taxed for the king's military campaigns to reclaim land he lost in a family feud, which wasn't really going all that well anyway. They demanded that the king sign a document that limited royal power and set in place three cornerstones of liberty. The rule of law representative government, and trial by jury. That document became known as Magna Carta, which is Latin for Great Charter. No free man shall be taken, imprisoned, or in any other way destroyed, except by the lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. To no one will we sell, to none will we deny or delay right or justice. At Runnymede, at Runnymede, your rights were won at Runnymede. No free man shall be fined or bound, or dispossessed of freehold ground, except by lawful judgment found and passed upon him by his peers. Forget not, after all these years, the charter signed at Runnymede. And before these guys got together for this little beach party, we know that the Vikings had some sense of the value of the jury trial, and that later Ethelred the Unready who ruled the English from 978 to 1016, set up a system in which 12 minor nobles in each district were to investigate crimes without a bias. But things were still not quite right. Starting well before King John, English royalty could do almost anything they wanted with no repercussions, as long as the nobility went along with it. These rulers often saw trial by jury as an impediment to their power and did almost anything to find ways around it, including the dreaded Court of Star Chamber. The Court of Star Chamber, a secret court, became synonymous with the misuse and abuse of royal power. It was used as a substitute for Parliament and to prosecute dissenters, including many Puritans who later fled to America. Remember the Mayflower? In the Star Chamber, the Council could inflict any punishment short of death, 
and frequently sentenced objects of its wrath to the pillory, to whipping, and to the cutting off of ears. The Star Chamber finally summoned juries before it for verdicts disagreeable to the government, and fined and imprisoned them. I believe another unfortunate soul is about to be interrogated by the Star Chamber. Let's go over and have a look. How do you plead, John Lilburn? Once again, I must insist on hearing the charges against me. Take him to the pillory. Without ever knowing the charges against him, John Lilburn was stripped, flogged, and dragged by an ox cart to the pillory at Westminster. If you don't know what a pillory is, consider yourselves lucky. It's a terrible, torturous contraption that, like the stocks, exposes its captive to public display and ridicule. I wish I could tell you that the royal manipulation of justice ended with Lilburn or the Star Chamber. But 32 years later, at the trial of William Penn, a young Quaker preacher and future founder of Pennsylvania, we see all is not well. Penn had given a sermon on Grace Church Street before a crowd, which was considered an offense against the king, who was head of the Church of England. Penn was on trial for his life, charged with sedition against the crown. If found guilty, he would be executed. Watch what happens. How say you? Is William Penn guilty or not guilty of the crime for which he is indicted? Guilty of speaking in Grace Church Street, my lord. Is that all? That is all I have to say. The laws of England will not allow you to leave until you have provided the court with a real verdict. We have given our verdict and can give no other. The jury is sent to deliberate again. A half hour later it returns without changing its verdict. Again they are sent away this time locked up without food or water to assist in their finding of an acceptable verdict. The next morning, nothing has changed. Guilty of speaking, but not of doing so unlawfully. I am instructing the clerk to draw up a special verdict, directing that the prisoner be found guilty. <laughs> Members of the jury, for giving a false verdict, the court fines each of you 40 marks and orders that you be imprisoned until the fine is paid. While in prison, one of Penn's jurors filed a writ of habeas corpus with the Court of Common Pleas, a type of appeals court, arguing that his imprisonment was unlawful. England's Chief Justice agreed and ordered the release of Penn's jurors. Jefferson, I thought you were in France. Uh, I'm back. How are things going inside? Hot, man, hot. Several delegates have swooned and had to be carried out. I know Madison wants secrecy, but we need some air and some other faces to gaze upon. The heat is oppressive, but don't you think Madison's discretion makes sense under the circumstances? Indeed, and I wish I could report to you that progress is being made, but we cannot seem to agree on anything except, it seems, for the value of trial by jury. I must get back inside before Madison gives too much power to the states. The abuses of the past were front and center, and when we came together to write the national constitution, we knew we needed to ensure that arbitrary and unchecked power wouldn't be the norm in our young country. We believed that the combination of an independent judiciary and the right to be tried by a jury of our peers would protect us from whatever form tyranny might take. You see, judicial independence protects judges from outside pressures, so they can make unbiased decisions. Without it, judges wouldn't be able to uphold the rule of law, the idea that the law, not any person, rules supreme. In England, Magna Carta finally made the king subject to the law. In our country, the Constitution rules supreme. The institution of the trial by jury has been sanctified by the experience of the ages. It has been recognized by the Constitution of every state in the Union. It is deemed the birthright of Americans, and it is deemed that liberty cannot subsist without it. Many of those who gathered to draft the Constitution were lawyers, so we naturally turned to the legal system we knew and admired, English common law. This shared heritage is most apparent in our Bill of Rights, which was written in 1791, when the first Congress met. You might say the Bill of Rights was a bit of a compromise, 
When the first Congress met, four of the states still had not ratified the Constitution and said they would not unless certain rights were added. Three of the new amendments addressed the right to trial by jury. The Fifth Amendment guarantees no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The Sixth Amendment guarantees in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. And the Seventh Amendment extends the right to trial by jury to civil cases. But let's return to the present and see what two Supreme Court justices have to say on the subject of juries. When our Constitution was formed in the 1700s, there was no clear understanding of what the framers were going to come up with when they started writing our Constitution, with one exception. They were absolutely clear in their minds that we wanted to provide for trial by jury. That was a given. The framers of our Constitution felt so strongly about trial by jury that they put it in the Constitution. They put it in the Bill of Rights. It applies to criminal trials, to all criminal trials. It applies to many civil trials. They regarded it as one of the most important safeguards of democracy. I think in, to their minds it was as important as the right to vote. And jurors really are experts, more than we judges are, on the thing that we ask juries to do, and that is to make findings of fact. We don't take just retired people or people who have time on their hands. We want the whole community represented. We want people who are uh, people engaged in their ordinary work but who take time off to hear a case as well as others. We want a full sampling of the community because that's who we are entrusting our lives and our honor and our most important issues. What we ask jurors to do um, are things that they're, they're really experts on. They are more expert than we judges are in judging ordinary human behavior. Just because they are, are living um, in the community and they meet all sorts of people and they find themselves in a great variety of situations. And so um, our legal system is based on the idea that they can, they can hear a witness testify and make a good judgment about whether that witness is telling the truth or whether the witness really remembers. By including a broad spectrum of the community in the jury pool, we're assured of a broader perspective in the jury that actually sits on the case. Let's say I'm a doctor. Uh, I'm very busy and I'm called for jury duty. I may not want to go, uh, but if I'm sued as a doctor, uh, I would probably like to have somebody like me serving on the jury. Or, you know, maybe I'm uh, an interstate truck driver. I'm away from home a lot. I'm on the road serving on a jury is uh, a big inconvenience for me. But I could well be a party to a case. And wouldn't I want somebody like me to be on the jury? Not necessarily a doctor or a truck driver, but somebody like me in some sense. Uh, so it is very important for people from all walks of life, no matter how busy they are, to report for jury duty along with everybody else. It's important that people who have children serve on juries. It's important that people who uh, are, are very busy at work serve on juries. Uh, it's not good for juries to be uh, drawn only from a narrow segment of the community. When we first started having jury trials, only white males who were property owners in this country could serve as trial jurors. Six or seven years before I was nominated as a justice, there were still states that gave women an excuse anytime they wanted not to serve on juries. That has since changed. The courts now make a very great effort to make sure that the jury pool is truly representative of the community. At times in the past, it was not. Uh, it was badly skewed in some places at some times, and, and that and major efforts have been made to correct that. Trial by jury, at the end of the day, requires the jurors to get together in the jury room as a small group and hammer out the facts, the evidence, which they've heard, and talk about it and try to reach a consensus. 
it's not unlike what nine justices have to do at the U.S. Supreme Court. After we have heard arguments in a case, all the nine justices meet in a, a conference room. It's private, just like the jury room is. We all have the opportunity to speak. We try to persuade each other. We try to reach an agreement. That is exactly what happens in the trial jury process. People get together, having heard everything, all the evidence and the judge's instructions, and then try to hammer out what they think they can agree to on the case. It's a pretty good process. I know many, many people who've been called for jury duty and they said, you know, I didn't want to serve. I went, to, I went down to the courthouse very reluctantly and in a disgruntled frame of mind. But I did serve and I really felt a sense of having uh, made a good contribution to the community by, by serving. And I would be very happy to serve again. I think most of us realize that um, there but for the grace of God go I. I might be one of the litigants someday in a courtroom needing to have the issues addressed by a jury drawn from my community. And I want good citizens to be on my own jury if that ever happens to me. So I think when I get a notice like that, I should respond favorably, and so should you. I leave you with one final thought. Because we live in a democracy, we owe a debt to the past generations who sacrificed their lives to secure the freedoms we enjoy today. And we owe it to future generations to preserve and protect those freedoms so that they may enjoy them too. Performing our duty as jurors, as peers of our fellow citizens, is one way we are expected to repay that debt. The future of democracy, like so much else, rests in your hands. I pray you handle all with care. <laughs>